This morning, we begin the Advent season, and if you haven't done so already, turn to Psalm 2, as uh, this Advent we are going to be working through many of those psalms that you see in your bulletin. I hope you will take time each week before Sunday uh, to read through these psalms and to prepare your heart for worship as we look in depth at what the Old Testament has to say about the coming of the Messiah. There are many different passages, many different passages in Scripture that we could turn to in order to focus on the advent of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. But I have chosen to go back to the Old Testament in particular, Sometimes as Christians, we forget that the entire Old Testament pointed forward in various ways to the coming of the Son of God, the Messiah. And that Old Testament saints, they trusted in the covenant promises that God had made, whereby he would save his people from their sins. And he would do this through his Messiah. I'm reminded of Jesus' own words after his resurrection as he's walking on that road and he comes across two individuals, two disciples who were really bewildered at what had taken place, unsure what to make of it. And listen to what he says to them. This is Luke Chapter 24. O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then listen to what the text says next. And beginning with Moses... And all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Jesus is clear, isn't he? He's clear that all of the scriptures spoke about him. A portion of these scriptures would have included the Psalms, some of the most cherished passages for Israel in the Old Testament. Psalms that they would have sung in their own household, specifically with one another as they gathered in order to worship God himself. And as we read through these psalms, we encounter several what are referred to as royal messianic psalms. That is, psalms that point us forward to the coming of the Savior the Messiah King. Now, there are also what are called suffering messianic psalms. These are psalms that picture the humiliation and the suffering of the Messiah to come. But there's also what I'm referring to as royal messianic psalms, psalms that picture the exaltation of the Messiah to come. And today, we're going to focus on one of those psalms, Psalm chapter 2. And I want you to have your Bible ready. Uh, Keep your finger in Psalm 2, because we're going to be looking at Psalm 2. But in doing so, we're also going to be looking at several other biblical passages in the New Testament that point us in one way or another, forward and backward, to what was said about this Messiah. Psalm 2, uh, if you look at at the passage in your Bible, Psalm 2 never actually tells us who the author is. But when we get to Acts chapter 4, this psalm is attributed by the early church to David himself, King David. Remember, I mentioned that Psalm 2 is a royal messianic psalm. This means that this psalm is focused on specifically on 
how God will bless his people and how he's going to do this through the Messiah, the son and the heir of David himself, who fulfills all of the covenant promises that God made to David. Think back, for example, to 2 Samuel chapter 7, where God comes and he speaks to David through the prophet Nathan. And what does God say there to David? God made a covenant with David, promising that he would raise up an offspring in the line of David, one from David, and he would establish this offspring's throne forever. There will be no end to the, to the throne and to the kingdom of this offspring. This promise begins to be seen with David's own son, Solomon, who builds the temple, but ultimately it's fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The Messiah, whose kingdom has no end, and whose reign is universal. It's in this passage that we see the Davidic Messiah, his throne and his kingdom, and the reign of his power established forever. Now this happens in 2 Samuel 7. And here we have a passage from David himself in Psalm 2. What a comfort this must have been to you if you were an Israelite during this time period in the Old Testament. What a comfort these covenant promises must have been in the decades and the centuries after David was on the scene. As their enemies would rule over them, Israel could turn and they could sing Psalm 2. Remembering God's covenant promises to David. But also looking to the future with tremendous hope. Knowing that the Davidic Messiah would one day come and he would reign. Not just over Israel, but over the nations. There is, however, a significant and a serious problem. A major problem. The nations themselves, as we'll learn in a minute, the nations would plot evil against the one true God and his anointed one. They stand, in other words, as the enemy to the kingdom's existence. And not just its existence, but even its worship. They threaten to wipe it out as they revolt against the God of Psalm 2. Well, this brings us to Psalm 2. And on your outline, I give you several points that we're going to follow as we look at these passages. So keep your Bible in one hand and your outline in the other. And it's going to guide us through these verses. In verses 1 through 3 of Psalm 2, we see that the nations rebel against the Lord and against his anointed one. But, and here is what's key, they do so in vain. Listen to Psalm 2, verses 1 through 3. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Verse 1 is not a rhetorical question, is it? Excuse me, it is a rhetorical question. <laughs> it's not a, a question that's just asking for information. It's a rhetorical question. David is not asking this question looking for an answer, but instead showing just how astonished he is, and how astonished God is, really, that the Gentile nations dare think 
that they can oppose the one true and living God. Notice what's taking place here. Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 most likely were originally one. These two psalms serve as introductions to the entire book of psalms. In Psalm 1, the godly man meditates on the law of the Lord day and night, and he delights in it. But in Psalm 2, by contrast, the unbelieving Gentile nations, what are they meditating on? They're meditating on how they might oppose God. But it's not just the Lord that they are plotting against. It's the Lord, and what does the text say? And His anointed. This word anointed is where we get the words Messiah in Hebrew and Christ from Greek. In verse 2, the word does not refer to just a mere servant, but instead refers to the Messiah Himself, the heir, the heir of David. The arrogance of these peoples and these rulers and these kings is so evident in verse 3. It's evident when they say, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. In other words, they are declaring their independence. No longer will we be under the rule and the reign of the Lord and His anointed. We will be the master of our own fate. We will be a God to ourselves. Nowhere in history has such godless independence and arrogance been so apparent than at the cross of Jesus Christ. It's at the cross that the rulers, the most powerful on earth, came together raging, plotting, not just against the Lord, but against His anointed against the Son of God. There we see the height of our sinful hearts, of our sinful rebellion against the Lord. Rather than worshiping the Son, we crucified Him. In Acts chapter 4, the early church quotes from this psalm to make this very point, in order to demonstrate that the words of David have come true. Listen to the prayer of these early Christians in Acts chapter 4, verses 25 through 28. And notice how it begins. Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of who? Of our father David, your servant said by the Holy Spirit, why did the, the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly, in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. 
So here you have Psalm 2. The rulers gathered together against Jesus himself, whom God had anointed. Nevertheless, though these rulers plotted against the Lord's anointed, Psalm 2 and even Acts chapter 4, they say that they did so in vain. Which brings us to our next point. Number two. The Lord laughs. He laughs at those who oppose him and his anointed. Listen to Psalm 2, verses 4 through 6. He who sits in the heavens laughs. And the Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. The most powerful men in the world came against the Lord and his anointed. And what does God do? He laughs. He laughs at them. This passage, it brings me back to to another passage, Isaiah chapter 40, which speaks of the greatness and the strength of the Lord. And, And in that passage, it says, Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. All the nations are nothing, are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. Have you ever been at the beach running your hands through the sand, grabbing a handful of it, as the sand then just falls through your fingers and you just shake it off. And perhaps as you're sitting there, you see a single tiny grain of sand left, maybe on your pinky finger. That is what the nations are like to God. All of them together plotting against the Lord. They're like a little grain of sand on your finger. And what do you do? You just flick it off. It's nothing. It's no threat. They're like that tiny drop of water that comes out of the faucet down into a massive bucket. It's just a drop. They're like a flake of dust. Just a flake of dust on your bookshelf. Can you can you see, can you begin to fathom why God sees this and he just laughs? He just laughs at this. I mean, there is rarely a time in Scripture when the text says God laughs. And this is it. He just laughs at them, at these nations who are holding up their fists, opposing him defying him, acting like they can revolt against his sovereign plan. He laughs at them. He sits on his heavenly throne. They're no match for him. And then when he chooses to to then speak, he terrifies these rulers simply by the words he speaks. He terrifies them and his wrath and his fury, as the text says. While they believe 
They hold ultimate power and authority. God, what does he do? He sets his anointed one. He sets him as a king on Zion, his holy hill. Demonstrating his universal dominion and sovereign rule. We cannot miss, we we cannot miss how that prayer by the early church in Acts 4 ends. Have you ever noticed how the prayer ends? For truly in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus to do whatever your hand and your plan God had predestined to take place. Not even the crucifixion of the Son of God Himself could thwart the eternal plan of God. In fact, to their surprise, it was exactly what He had planned. Number three. God appoints his son to reign as sovereign ruler over the nations. We see this in verses 7 through 9. In the midst of these nations raging, the people plotting, and the kings and the rulers strategizing evil together, what does God do? The text says he appoints his son, the anointed one. Listen to verses 7 through 9. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give, I will make the nations your inheritance, your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Certainly, David was appointed by God as king. But in verses 7 through 9, we see something here where there's something much greater going on. Verses 7 through 9 speak of one far greater than David, the son of David, the messianic king. God the Father appointed his son as Messiah, the one who would establish an everlasting kingdom and deliver his people just as he promised to David. Notice that this father-son language in the text, it echoes and echoes the promises God made to David in 2 Samuel 7, where, as we saw, God said he would raise up one of David's offspring as a man. The New Testament authors quote and allude to Psalm 2-7 everywhere. In fact, it's a little overwhelming how often they come back to this verse on several different occasions. To begin with, both at Jesus' baptism and again at His transfiguration, Psalm 2-7 is alluded to when the Father declares, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Furthermore, Paul says in the opening chapter of his letter to the Romans, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through through his prophets and and the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son. And notice what he says next. Who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the Spirit of holiness, and notice how, by His resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. But not just Romans 1, Acts 13. Another passage where we see a quotation here of Psalm 2-7 from Paul. There, Paul, when testifying about Christ at Antioch, and after telling his listeners how Jesus 
was prophesied about in the Old Testament. How he died and then he rose from the grave only to then appear to many individuals. Paul says this, and we bring you the good news. What is this good news? That what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Both in Romans 1 and Acts 13, we see the Father begetting the Son. And this is directly connected to the resurrection of Christ. Where God declares Him to be His Son as victorious, vindicated. And so Paul can say in a passage like Colossians 1.18, that Christ is the firstborn from among the dead. We should also take notes of this word son. Earlier, he's referred to as anointed, but now he's referred to as son. One who is begotten of the Father, I think this is a clue to us. It's a clue to us that Psalm 2 sees the Messiah not just as another king who comes after David, but as a king who is much, much more than a mere man. He is one who is divine. This is one of the reasons why the author of Hebrews can quote from Psalm 2. We read in Hebrews 1 that while God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, in these last days He has spoken to us how? By His own Son, whom He appointed, and notice that phrase there, whom He appointed, the heir of all things, through whom He created, He also created the world. This is the radiance of the glory. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. And He upholds the universe by the word of His power. The author goes on and he describes how Christ made purification for sins. And then what did He do next? He didn't remain dead. He rose and he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. This is not a mere man that we are dealing with. He is greater than the angels. In order to prove this, the author of Hebrews quotes from Psalm 2 next. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. That's in Hebrews. Of course, such such an appointment in Psalm 2, it's a kingly appointment. One in which the Son will rule and reign over all the earth. Look at Psalm 2, verse 6. There, he's referred to as a king. And so, as a son receiving, as a king would, this inheritance from his father... What is he invited to do next? Ask. Ask of me. Son, king, the one who's to receive this, this great inheritance, ask of me. I will give you a heritage. I will give you an inheritance 
Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. The nations, they're yours. The whole earth, it's yours. Never mind the fact that they are raging against you. You rule over them. They are under your reign. When they oppose you, you will break them down. And you will do it with a rod of iron. You will smash them into pieces like a potter who takes that vessel and throws it against the floor. How true this is. How true this is in light of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. People, our Savior is not dead in a tomb. He is alive and He reigns at the right hand of the Father. He has conquered His enemies by His death and resurrection. And there is a day coming, there is a day coming when he will return. And this time, it will be with a sword. He will return and judge his enemies. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, the end is coming when Christ will deliver the kingdom of God, to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And doesn't the book of Revelation say the same? Revelation 12.5, we read that the Messiah is one who is to rule all the nations with what? A rod of iron. Revelation 19.15, Jesus, the Messiah, what does he refer, how is he described? He's described as this rider on a white horse. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. For he, it says, will rule them with a rod of iron. And he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God. The wrath of God Almighty. And then it says, he is the one who has the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Number four. In verses 10 through 12, we see that we are to submit to the Son. We are to submit to the Son. Now that it's clear, and I've spent so much time making it clear that the Son has the power and the right to shatter the nations who oppose Him into pieces, what is the proper response? Submission. Worship. Allegiance to Him. Only then will the nations find everlasting blessing. Listen. Listen to what we read in Psalm 2, verses 10 through 12. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. And rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He Be angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. And notice what it says last. Blessed, blessed are all who take refuge in him. This is a severe warning. 
a severe warning, but it's also a warning in which there is a promise of tremendous blessing. Tremendous blessing. By kissing the Son, they show their submission, their repentance, their reverence, and their allegiance. They sh should they instead spit at the Son with their mouth rather than kissing Him, they will ignite his anger, and they will perish under his wrath. But should they bow before him in repentance, in obedience? They receive mercy, grace, forgiveness. They receive a safe haven, a refuge, peace, joy, and everlasting life. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. At the end of all of this talk about how the anointed one, the Messiah, will crush the rulers of this earth, his enemies, the nations that rebel against them and deserve his wrath, at the end of all of this, God puts before them mercy, grace, forgiveness. The final word is one of graciousness. Those who kiss the Son will find a safe haven you will find a refuge in God. Those who take refuge in His wings will be blessed. What about you? What about you? Have you turned to Jesus to be reconciled with the one true and living God? Or are you like those rulers, those nations, those people who thought so much of themselves and rose up against him, rejecting him as their king and lord? Which is it? There is no middle way. There's no middle way. Do not be fooled into thinking there is another way. It's one or the other. At the root of your sin and your rebellion, there is a revolt in your heart, a revolt against the Lordship of God and His Christ. Charles Spurgeon said of Psalm, 20, Psalm 2, here is a description of the hatred of human nature against the Christ of God. You see, if you are apart from Christ, if you are not in Christ Jesus, your fundamental problem cannot be reduced to some philosophical argument against the existence of God or to how you are just jaded by the hypocrisy you see in the church or whatever else excuse you might try to think of. 
No, your fundamental problem is that you are a sinner. And you will not submit yourself to the lordship of King Jesus. That is the core of the problem. You will be your own God. And you will go your own way. You will be the captain of your own soul, no doubt. Well, Paul says in Romans 1.22, claiming to be wise, you have become a fool. On the day of judgment, you will stand you will stand before a risen resurrected king with nail marks in his hands and feet. Reigning at the right hand of the Father. And he, listen to me, he will crush you in his wrath. If you think that the nations are easy for him, what is one like you? You don't hear this at Christmas time, do you? But that's not the end of the message, is it? That's not the end of Psalm 2. If you humble yourself, repent of your sin, and turn to the cross, falling down on your knees before the cross and that empty tomb, even though you raged against Christ, you, you will find peace and joy and safety and eternal life. People, that is good news. And that is good news for the nations. So, if that is you, come to Jesus today. Today. Kiss the Son. What about the church? What about believers? What does Psalm 2 mean for us today? Certainly in these many New Testament passages, we see so many messianic implications. And this is the joy of getting to take this time, these next couple of weeks, and focus on these psalms. We see that truly Jesus is the fulfillment, the true final fulfillment of Psalm 2. As the Gospels and so many other New Testament texts testify, Jesus was born in the line of David. And he has the right to the Davidic throne. His enemies will be crushed. And they will be crushed under his feet. As Genesis 3.15 talked about. Promising even with Adam and Eve. And his kingdom, as God promised to David in 2 Samuel 7, his kingdom will have no end. As those who have been united to this Messiah upon faith, and as those who are his church, his bride, that's us. What does this mean for us? Well, we could spend a whole other sermon on this. But one thing I want to mention is that it means, at the very least, that we have an unshakable hope. We have an unshakable hope because we belong to a Savior whose sovereign rule cannot be thwarted. Even on the cross, he cries out, it is finished. And three days later, he rises from the grave. That is our Savior. A day is coming when final victory will be had. 
That day is coming. And every nation will bow before his throne. They will bow before the Lord's anointed, as Psalm 2 says. In the meantime, Jesus taught us to pray that God's kingdom would come and that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is our prayer this morning. That's our prayer. God, may your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I want to close this morning with a prayer, but not from me, from someone else. His name is Peter Vermigli. He lived in the 16th century. And honestly, I don't know that I could pray Psalm 2 this well. So bow your heads with me as we close with this prayer.